Hello, I'm Paul Peterson. Rheumatology is a field that emphasizes bones and muscles, but also encompasses rare autoimmune diseases. On this edition of Aging in LA, we will find out how this field provides insight and information to care for patients with osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, and other diseases. You will learn where and how to be tested to determine your level of vulnerability to such diseases and what you can do to help yourself. Stay tuned for Aging in LA. Rheumatology is now emerging as an important clinical specialty all over the world. Rheumatologists are now capable of treating most of the chronic rheumatological disorders with the discovery of new disease-modifying agents called biologics. According to some studies, up to 70% of patients with rheumatoid arthritis can now be cured with the introduction and widespread use of biologic treatment. Our guest today is from the Sweezy Institute, which is renowned for the evaluation and care of back and neck pain, osteoporosis, and musculoskeletal disorders. Please welcome to Dr. Elise Rubenstein. Thanks for joining us, Doctor. What a pleasure to have you Thank here. Thank you very much for having me. You know, what a hopeful opening it was to, for me to be able to say in 70% of the cases, help is available. Mm -hmm. is, it, where, is that because of the de de development of new drugs or studies? You're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. If you give it 10 or even 20 years ago, there was very little that we could do for those patients ex except throwing out things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, a Tylenol or an aspirin. Mm -hmm. And in the last 10 years, they've developed amazing drugs. You've said one of them, the mm -hmm. biologics, <coughs> which are these drugs that can change the course of these disease, if not put them in remission and stop the disease from progressing. That is wonderful news because Arthritis, Arthur as we call it in our family, <laughs> has been a plague of growing old for centuries, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the majority of people suffer from some type of arthritis mm -hmm. as they age. And you start to feel it. Everybody does when they get but older. It, it comes in so many degrees. I mean, some people mm -hmm. are, are only slightly impaired, and yet other people, mm -hmm. we have all seen the, the gnarled hands and truly being crippled by this illness. Well, that's absolutely true, and there's many types of arthritis. Mm -hmm. There's over a hundred different varieties of arthritis, and the most common one is osteoarthritis, mm -hmm. which affects the majority of people. Right, osteo meaning bone, right? Uh -huh. Well, okay. arthritis means a disease of bones, mm -hmm. of where two bones that come together have a lining of cartilage, which starts to get eroded, and then you get start to get the bones opposing each other, right. and they start to grind, is what sometimes people feel. So the most common form of that is osteoarthritis. It mm -hmm. happens as people age, and there can be other risk factors. Well, you astonished me earlier. We were off air when mm -hmm. I asked, does this affect children? And you said, yes, indeed, it can. Mm -hmm. It for sure does, and that would be another type of arthritis, and those are inflammatory arthritis. It, and rheumatoid arthritis is the most common one mm -hmm. that that affects. I, well, what gets inflamed? Is it the, the tissue separating the bones, or is it it's the bones It's actually themselves? the bones that come together are mm -hmm. surrounded by what's called a synovium, or a capsule, mm -hmm. and that gets inflamed. But that's not the only thing that's inflamed. The whole core of the body gets inflamed, and it becomes a systemic disease, so wow. we can diagnose it at times in the blood. Now that's not the only way. We take the mm -hmm. patient as a whole and we speak with them and examine them and look at x-rays. But the whole body is inflamed, but it presents itself most commonly in the joints. What, what, are the, what do people present to you in terms of symptoms that have brought them to the, to the institute for evaluation? Is it, mm -hmm. is it a disquiet or is there genuine physical discomfort? Oh, there's genuine di physical discomfort. Really? And it varies. Just like you said, people mm -hmm. have varying degrees. Some people it's very minor. All of a sudden, they're walking and they feel a little bit of a pain, and it comes and goes, let's say, in a knee. Right. Other people can hear things. You have a grinding or a clicking sound. Whoa, mm -hmm. clicks, no good, no, no good. No good at all. <laughs> and then it can go on and on, where mm -hmm. you can see bony abnormalities or big growths on fingers, right. yeah. people see. And then there could be deformities, actually, of where a finger gets moved to the side, mm -hmm. or you see a knee that's 
bowed outward. I see. So it goes in varying degrees from very something minor to something very extensive. Yeah, when you said comes and goes, I have noticed there are times in my life when mm -hmm. I've had something to eat that suddenly I've got tremendous knee pain, for example, in the old traditional description of gout. Is, does okay. diet pay, play a role in, in, in this? I mean, is mm -hmm. this something if we're more careful in our 20s and 30s and 40s, we can forestall the onset of arthritis? So there are certain forms of arthritis. Remember, mm -hmm. there's many types of where diet does play a role. Mm -hmm. And you pick the perfect one, no, gout. <laughs> so gout is a disease where you can have um, different periods of inflammation in the joints due to food intake. And mm -hmm. this has to do with a food or an amino acid called a purine. And this can be found in red meats, in beer, and different types uh -huh. of foods that you eat, in shellfish. So I always tell people, try and avoid these foods. Now, if they uh -huh. avoid them more often, they'll have less attacks of this. I see. But sometimes it's more of a genetic reason that they build this up. Either mm -hmm. they're not pushing it out through the kidneys enough, or they're producing too much in the body. So they can be helped sometimes by the foods you eat, but other times they do need a medicine. Well, to let stop me ask it. a question. When, as a person ages, uh, and they've had these symptoms, are, are, these, are these the reasons that, that hips wear out and, and knees wear out? Is this part of that process where there's actual deterioration? So these joints can wear out because of arthritis. Mm -hmm. And then there are the other reasons, too, because there's not always one reason that something happens. Mm -hmm. But um, there are risk factors on why hips or knees can wear off. Um, age. So right. as a person ages, they're more likely to get arthritis. If they have a coexisting comorbidity, like rheumatoid arthritis, you're more likely to get um, osteoarthritis. If you're taking certain medications like prednisone, oh. Oh, prednisone. you're more okay. likely to get arthritis because mm -hmm. it makes the bones more weak. Um, there's many nutritional deficiencies. There's a lot of different reasons, genetic reasons why people can get these diseases. Well, I, obviously, there's a reason this field has become a specialty. It's a fascinating is, field, it's, absolutely. It's way more complicated than, mm -hmm. than someone like me, a layman, is led to, oh. to understand. No, but, <laughs> but, but we try to make it simple. Well, we, I, you know, sometimes we have to accept that life is a complicated thing and absolutely. our health is very complicated and it's kind of like that balloon where you press it over here and it pops out over there mm -hmm. we can often do this to ourselves and i wonder absolutely. that the seniors take a lot of medications they do and i'm not sure they're they're always aware of the interactions of these things mm -hmm. so you're absolutely correct there's a lot of things that we can do to <laughs> ourselves that can cause a different disorders mm -hmm. like food intake or taking medications being overweight, not exercising yeah. enough. So there's a lot of prevention that can be done. Yeah, Eating correctly and um, exercising. If you're elderly, making sure to pay attention to surfaces around you, not mm -hmm. skid floors, making right. sure mats aren't up, that it's well lit in homes. Right, the, those old toe-catching rug runners. It's absolutely oh, true. <laughs> yeah, they, mm -hmm. they are. Now, what would, uh, is there um, osteoporosis in my mind uh, has generated a certain brittleness in the bone structure, so breaks are more, fractures are mm -hmm. more common. Uh, is, is this something that once the process is underway can be stalled or, or reversed, if you will? So osteoporosis is a very <coughs> fascinating disease of where it encompasses patients who have weak bones and they're more prone to fracture. Mm -hmm. It affects close to 10 million people in the American population here. Wow. Yeah, so it's very, it's very prevalent, much more than we think, more men than women. Mm -hmm. And once it starts, sure, it can be halted if measures are taken, if secondary risk factors that are found are stopped, for example, diet. Right. Vitamin D has become very, very popular in checking right. levels and making sure people have an adequate intake, right. taking well, the appropriate amount of calcium. Sorry. Calcium, well, the, mm -hmm. the traditional, give me my milk. Well, let's take a little break here, and well, let's go visit the Sweezy Institute where Dr. Sweezy himself and his staff help a patient with an exercise that will help her get in and out of bed. In the gym where we're gonna learn the pelvic pinch. This is a key exercise, it's really a movement that'll help you do what you need to do to stabilize your back so that you can make the moves in your life skills without straining or irritating your back and causing pain. To do that, Babe Samra, our physical therapist, is gonna teach Anya Kemak, who's a personal trainer and works with us here at the Institute. Now, this program of back stabilization with the pelvic pinch as the key to it is what we're going to move from right now. Okay. Anya, what I need you to do is I'm going to have you bend one knee at a time and put your foot flat on the bed. Okay? Then the next thing you're going to do is I'm going to put my hand up under here. You're going to tight and gently squeeze your stomach and tighten your buttocks and push your stomach down so that you feel the pressure on my hand. Do you feel that? Mm -hmm. Now this should be a firm 
feel back here, mm -hmm. okay? Let me just make a point here. When you, when you get that firm feel, you should feel that firm, friendly hand of mine. I hope it's firm and friendly. And that's the way your mattress should feel. And when you're sitting down, that's the way it should feel in, the, in your back against the chair. This is key to back comfort and back support and back stabilization. Okay. All right, so now we're going to have you do it. Okay, why don't you put your legs down. All right. Now, one leg at a time, you're going to bend your knee and put your foot flat on the bed. Other knee flat on the bed. Your stomach, everything, you're, you're flat. Just the point about that one knee at a time, that's, it's much easier on your back to deal with one leg coming up at a time than when you try to bend two. And when you're having severe pain, any pain you can avoid is a plus. Right, it's really to prevent straining. So, okay, my hand goes under here. Now you're going to tighten your stomach and squeeze your buttocks. And that's a good feel. I can feel some pressure back there. That's perfect, okay? Now that's the pelvic pinch. In summary, to do a pelvic pinch, you should first lie on your back with your knees up and your feet flat. Then push your stomach in and squeeze your buttocks together. It's a very subtle movement. Now we're going to incorporate the pelvic pinch into life skills. Here in the bedroom, I'd like you to meet Kathy Warner, our occupational therapist. She's going to first demonstrate how to get in and out of bed with as little pain as possible. Kathy? Thank you, Dr. Sweezy. And here we have Janet with us today to help us demonstrate these. What we're going to be teaching you is how to get in and out of bed and how to do a log roll. All of these will help you do it with as little pain as possible. We're going to incorporate the pelvic pinch into these movements. Okay, Janet, first what I want you to do is do your pelvic pinch, okay? And as you sit down, reach for the bed also with your hands so that you're supporting yourself and stabilizing yourself. Okay. There you go. Once you're at that point, hold your pelvic pinch and scoot back. Okay. You can see how Janet did that. She's scooting back on the bed. Great. As Janet's going to be lying down, what we're going to want to incorporate again is the pelvic pinch. She's going to be reaching for the side of the bed and incorporating that stabilization for us. Okay, Janet, reach for the side of the bed with your hands. Bring your legs up. There you go. Get your head down on the pillow. Good. All right. Again, maintain that pelvic pinch. And we're going to roll using these three points as a reference point. She's going to move her knees, her hips, and her shoulders together. Okay, Janet. Great. All right. And she's stabilizing and hopefully doing that in a comfortable way. Now, when we're going to get out of bed, again, we're going to be doing our pelvic pinch, holding that. We're going to move in our log roll fashion. Okay, here we go. Pelvic pinch, log roll to your side. Good, good. Okay, when we're going to get up, this is important that you use your hands here to push off with and you swing your legs down at the same time. Maintain your pelvic pinch. And here we go. Up. Good. All right. As you can see, she's moving through these units, and she's holding that pelvic pinch and using the log roll. And as we're going to get out, we're going to scoot forward again. There you go. Nice wide base of support. There you go. Okay, and stand up. Thank you. In summary, what we've tried to do today is show you in the bedroom the incorporation of the pelvic pinch with your life skill of getting in and out of the bed and using the log roll. Wow, that was great. That these are learnable skills, aren't they? These are applicable exercises mm -hmm. that people can take home with them and use in their everyday life to feel better when they have arthritic pain. Well, of course, I, I was chuckling to myself, I must admit, because I'm thinking, okay, getting into bed, i got to move a 12-pound dog and a 30-pound dog, you know. <laughs> so it becomes a challenge, you well, see, and you have exactly. to learn how to do it appropriately in your setting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the role of exercise? I know I'm forever telling people you've got to be more active, mm -hmm. you know, don't become a vegetable. But good exercise can help with all of these symptoms mm -hmm. of, of, of rheumatological disorders. Mm -hmm. Well, there's aerobic exercise, mm -hmm. and that allows you to increase your heart rate right. and allows you to function better overall, which should be done a few times a week. Mm -hmm. And there are also other things like strengthening exercises and resistance exercises, which can be done. And they can be maintained on an everyday basis mm -hmm. to maintain what you have, your range of motion of different joints and muscles, and to strengthen what's already there. Right. A lot of times this can be done at home. Right, and, and some simple exercises too, mm -hmm. sitting in a chair or mm -hmm. being able to maybe do a squat to keep your quads tight. Uh, sitting in a chair and just elevating your legs up and See? holding it strengthens the quadriceps here mm -hmm. and it allows the kneecap or the patella bone to become stronger mm -hmm. when you have a knee issue. Great, there. great. See, these are all handy tips. Now, it's time for another break and when we come back, we'll continue our discussion on rheumatology and the Sweezy Institute. We'll be right back. Thank you. 
I have cash for seven to nine days. I also have a copy of my passport, birth certificate, and insurance papers. Hi, it's me. I have water and food. Don't forget, we'll need a first aid kit and my prescription medicine. Got your message. I have clothes in the flashlight pack. I'll bring batteries and some tools, too. We'll bring the radio. A disaster can happen anytime. Are you prepared? At your next family gathering, build your emergency kit. Find the 10 essential items and more at labt.org. Just be ready. Prepare together. Let's learn about tailgating. Hey, that's how I got my ticket. You got a ticket for tailgating? That's not good. That like, can be really annoying. Didn't get you there any faster. It leaves you no distance to break. Which makes it easier to get into a crash. And it also may increase your insurance premium. And I hate tailgating. Tailgating causes crashes. Back off. Watch the road. Welcome back to Aging in L.A. Our topic today is prevention of musculoskeletal problems. Our guest is from the Sweezy Institute, Dr. Elise Rubenstein. Doctor, the, the prevention is such an important element in this, and you already showed, you see, even sitting in a chair, how lifting your leg can help with the quadriceps and uh, alignment. Uh, are there other sort of simple uh, at-home exercises that a person can do? Absolutely. And what I did is I brought with me one of these exercise balls that we have at the Sweezy Institute yes, right I now. Yes, I noticed that big white thing right there. Right here. <laughs> now, what is this called? So this is called an osteo ball. Osteo ball, mm -hmm. okay. And it's an amazing tool that we have, and it's a way to strengthen muscles and, mm -hmm. in fact, increase bone mass. It has shown with some of the studies that we have. Mm -hmm. And what this is, is this ball that's inflated two-thirds the way. Two-thirds of the way, right. Mm -hmm, it's used for isometric or resistance mm -hmm. exercises. So you have two little handles here, and you pull outward on it, and then you hold at that place. I see. And it can be done with a lot of different exercises. Okay, now, it, is it, mm -hmm. it's, oh, it's not heavy it's at all. It's very light. Okay, Anybody, even I, a 90-year-old can sit there and pick <laughs> well, this up. Exactly. It's still put there. You can, well, it, exactly. And there mm -hmm. are a whole lot of uh, exercises. Uh, exercises listed here mm -hmm. and, and numbered. Now, I believe we have some footage uh, of this actually being utilized so people Absolutely. can have an idea of how handy the, this could be. Is this something that can be prescribed at the Institute? Absolutely. We do that a lot for really? people that want this type of exercise. It works very well. well. Well, let's take a look at an exercise using the osteo ball that is a good upper back strengthener. The trainer is Kathy Stevens. You'll be positioning the ball behind you against the wall. You'll have the ball level with your hips and your palms flat against the ball. You're going to be exercising the muscles of the upper back, back side of the shoulders, and in general, all those postural muscles between the shoulder blades. So what you're going to want to do is step about two to four inches away from the ball so that your hips aren't touching the ball. And then you're going to create the contraction by pressing firmly into the ball, palms to ball, pushing that ball against the wall. And you want to progressively increase that tension contracting between the shoulder blades, the back side of the shoulders, even a little bit down the triceps. As you take the deep breath and count out, push one through push five. It's going to be important as you do this exercise that you keep your head and neck in alignment. A tendency might be to jet forward with the chin as you're pressing. So be aware of good standing alignment and then start that second repetition. Pushing the palms, contracting back, opening up the shoulders and chest, squeezing and contracting, and counting down, push one through push five. And then you can relax against the ball. Wow, that was very interesting. And it appeared to be quite simple. And those exercises are all illustrated on mm -hmm. this ball. It's for easy use. It comes with a mm -hmm. manual. And then people can just do it right from looking at the ball themselves once they get used to it. Right, very exactly. Simple. Well, I'm going to ask the ball to take a powder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have heard so often that people are afraid of being evaluated for fear of terrible news. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is the process for a person to contact the, the Sweezy Institute and come in for evaluation when they know something is wrong? Okay. So it depends on the route that they're going. Mm -hmm. So if it's for osteoporosis, what they would do is they'd contact the Institute, mm -hmm. they would get an appointment and come in for a bone density examination or a DEXA. 
uh -huh. and it's a very simple procedure. They lay flat on what would be considered like an examination bed, mm -hmm. and then you have a bar above you that just goes forward and back. It takes about 15 minutes. Wow, that's It's it. not invasive. Mm -hmm. Very little radiation. You get more radiation when you fry from Los Angeles to San Francisco than you would get sitting Wait, on well, this. Really? Mm -hmm. that, oh, that's that's it's very wonderful. nice to know that. That is good mm -hmm. because people do have concerns about they, that. They, I ask this uh, question a lot. Yeah. Now, you mentioned way at the beginning here that men get more rheumatoid arthritis than than women. No, actually, no. women, women females do get first. more okay. than men okay. for rheumatoid and, and arthritis. That doesn't that a lot have have to do with hormonal uh, changes that women go through after it, menopause, menopause and all? Well, for rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. um, it can happen almost at any age. There is a subset of people which get it, um, the majority of them in their 20s and 30s and 40s, but then wow. there's an older segment that can get it in their 50s mm -hmm. and 60s. But things like osteoporosis, osteoporosis. is I think what you might have been right, referring that's to, the one. Mm -hmm. yeah, can happen um, more commonly to women after they go in menopause. Mm -hmm. Their estrogen levels decrease, right. and the first seven years after menopause there's almost a 20 percent loss in bone density Wow! so it's really imperative at this time to go get checked with a uh, DEXA for a bone density examination to see where you sit at and what you need to do right. I can think of so many times I uh, granny grace lived with us in the house mm -hmm. and watching those physical changes the mm -hmm. the shrinkage and the suddenly the 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 back that was bowed and mm -hmm. watching those changes. So it's very going. interesting. Osteoporosis mm -hmm. can a lot of times be a silent disease of where we don't see anything or know yeah. what's happening until a fracture or a break occurs in the right. spine. Mm -hmm. Other times there can be physical manifestations mm -hmm. of compression fractures or what you had talked about, the hunched over right. feel where you get the back that's bowed but right, the exactly. patient becomes kyphotic. And this interferes with their daily life. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine, you're hunched over and your diaphragm is then being pushed in a different direction, you have more problems breathing because you're in this position, you're walking mm -hmm. with a forward gait, so you're walking different and there's more probability of falling. And falls are, they're, they're just and they're a already deadly there. thing. Mm -hmm. So yes. osteoporosis affects a, a large percentage of people in more ways than they even think. If they think they don't have the disease, they might. Are other organs involved? Are, are, is this something that sort of spreads when you said systemic? Is it something that would affect, oh, I don't know, hearing, balance? Uh, well, osteoporosis affects the bones because bones, it's for weak right. bones, but when a patient starts to hunch over, it can affect their breathing. I see. So there might be secondary consequences mm -hmm. because of the bones becoming um, broken with compression fractures or a, or a hip fracture. A patient might be bed bound, then they lose muscle mass, mm -hmm. and other things happened. Well, now the term we used was musculoskeletal. So I'm assuming mm -hmm. muscles are involved here as well mm -hmm. as they attach to the joints. Are those the parts of uh, like the pain puzzle that we go through? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the diseases that I take care of. Um, rheumatology encompasses musculoskeletal diseases. I see. So okay. the joints is mm -hmm. where arthritis or osteoporosis occurs. And then we get a lot of other issues with muscles themselves, of where they become inflamed mm, yeah. or muscles attached to um, joints by tendons. And we can get a tendonitis if you've ever heard that word. Oh, yes, I have. So this all encompasses the musculoskeletal system. So people can have um, areas of pain that are next to the joint like a tendonitis or an inflamed muscle or a bursitis and these can be overuse injuries or things like this. You know it almost sounds like we're talking about uh, the the post football weekend injury report because people are so athletic these days especially mm -hmm. in their 20s and uh, it seems to me that they are doing so, they are taking some long-term risks with their joint and bone health. Well you absolutely do. So yeah. one of the big risk factors for arthritis or um, tears and tendons or other things later mm -hmm. in life is prior trauma or athletes that are, are excessive athletes, um, right. high endurance athletes. Right, those extremists. <laughs> Boxers, when they're punching the bag, can hurt the base of their thumb. Sure. You have different athletes which can injure different areas of their mm -hmm. body and they're more prone to it. Kickboxers can injure their, their hips, if you can imagine, from kicking the bag. Well, what about things like on? little league elbow? You know, we have rules mm -hmm. where the kids aren't allowed to mm -hmm. pitch more so than a So there's tennis few elbow and right. then golfer's elbow, and people can get this. And I have a lot of men that after a game of golf, they'll come to me and say, it hurts me. And so oh. it was an overuse injury. Sure. They need to start abstaining from doing yeah. it in the way that they were doing it. Or there can oh, be other things that I can help to with. Abstain. <laughs> a golfer who loves to golf. Oh, exactly. They just want to get back to their activities. They want to live their life and enjoy them. So we give them tips to get back. So when you feel that twinge, 
now you'll have a number to call. It's up there on your screen to get a hold of the Sweezy Institute. Now, our time is up for today's edition of Aging in L.A. Thanks so much to our guest today, Dr. Elise Rubenstein of the Sweezy Institute. And now, it's time for our feature on Aging in L.A., Senior Stat Shots, where we look at statistics and information that pertain to senior citizens. And once again, we found today's statistics in the recently released L.A. County Seniors Count, a survey of the older adult population in Los Angeles City and County. That's about a million three hundred thousand people. So let's take a look at activities that seniors in the Los Angeles area are most interested in taking part in uh, in terms of activities. Forty seven percent of our senior citizens would like to be interested in recreational pursuits. Thirty six percent in educational activities. Ten percent would like to be involved in job training and placement. Fifty four percent more than half want physical exercise, 24% are interested in community involvement and volunteering, 42% like to be entertained at concerts, plays, and sports events, and 25% of seniors enjoy taking part in religious activities. Only 13% had no response to this particular question. And that's today's Senior Stat Shots. Now, you can get a, your, a copy of this report uh, simply by going online to www.laccd.org, and that means the Los Angeles County Community and Senior Services. Then click on L.A. County Seniors Count, and the full report will then appear. Or you can have a copy sent to you by mail by calling 213-738-2065. That's 213 213- 7382065 The Los Angeles Department of Aging produces this program with City View Channel 35 so that seniors living in Los Angeles and surrounding communities are well informed of the many issues that face them in everyday life and also to let you know of the many services that the Department of Aging offers our senior citizens Now we'd like to hear from you with comments on the program what you like what you think can be improved and ideas for future programs. So please give us a call. The number's right there on your screen, 213-252-4088. That's 213-252-4088. Call us with your comments and ideas, and we look forward to hearing from you. I'm Paul Peterson for the Los Angeles Department of Aging, the people here at City View, Channel 35, and all of our guests on Aging in LA. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.